The incoming Labour government carried out a programme of nationalisation and repealed Tory anti-union and anti-council housing laws. But then it imposed a social contract and wage controls with the support of trade union leaders. Uh, the Scargills and the McGachies are out to wreck the social contract, make no secret of the fact they are prepared to sacrifice the working people of this country on the altar of their Marxist ideology. Now, in fact, you are a member of the Communist Party. Do you think that the social contract plays any role at all, or do you, in fact, want to see it die? Well, it's really nothing to do with my membership of the Communist Party as to whether I believe uh, the social contract um, should live or die. In fact, there is a difference of opinion, you know, among a number of parties about this. Uh, certainly communists and left socialists and other people believe that the social contract is essentially a con trick. And if you don't mind me saying so, the television program you put on a little moment ago, the little uh, cosy story, was about as untypical of what's happening in industry as anything could have been. Uh, they, they didn't was, feel they were untypical. Well, they, anyway, they, none on. of us feel we're untypical, but I can assure you in the engineering industry it must have been a considerable job to find people like that. You see, there is a massive myth being perpetrated in British industry, and that is that it is wages which cause inflation, and it just is not true. A Labour minister said a little while ago, quite correctly, that the British inflation is a problem of overpriced goods produced with outdated machinery by underpaid workers and that is a very accurate description of what's happening in Britain and the problem that we face is the problem that's been left to us all as a nation by the owners of industry who have not invested not given us decent equipment and made it impossible for British workers to produce the wealth that they should be but do you now, now there is you, a raising sorry if I just ask yes? you this I mean do you now, as you did last autumn at the TUC see the social contract in fact as being a form of wages restraint? indeed I did in fact everything that's being said around this table only only confirms that I was correct no one talks about the extension of uh, uh, public ownership, the ability of Brit the British people to run their own economy. Yeah. David tried to introduce it, but in fact, what you and what was and other people have been talking about all the time is how workers are going to be persuaded to accept low wages to solve the problems which have been created by other people. Division and demoralisation in Labour's ranks led to Thatcher winning the 1979 general election. The massive British Leyland car plant at Longbridge, with its shop floor trade union organisation, epitomised the CP slogan, every factory a fortress. But helped by the intelligence services and right-wing union leaders, the company sacked chief convener Derek Robinson, a communist and staunch defender of workers' interests but labelled public enemy number one by the mass media. His offence, officially, publishing an alternative plan to secure the future of the plant. His sacking was really intended to send a message to every trade union representative in Britain. If we can sack Red Robbo, we can sack you. The boy said that they're going to take me to task But I'll be back by Christmas It's just a rumour that was spread around town Somebody said that someone got filled in For saying that people get killed
Tories threw millions of workers on the dole. The TUC and Labour leaderships were forced to support people's marches for jobs initiated by the Communist Party. During the 1983 general election, the Tories attacked CP and left-wing influence in the Labour Party. As Thatcher took revenge on the NUM in 1984, its Communist Vice President Mick McGahey, alongside President Arthur Scargill, embodied the heroic resistance of Britain's coal mining communities in the year-long strike. Magahi had long been a target for MI5 bugging, spying and burglary, along with Ken Gill, Margaret Whittam and other communist trade unionists. The British ruling class has always known the potential of the working class to put an end to capitalism. For that reason, state power on a large scale has been used to combat communist influence in the trade union movement. The Communist Party's strength, its base in the industrial unions, also pointed to a major weakness, its failure to recruit and promote more women. But female emancipation had featured in the party's policies from the beginning. While films and books encouraged young women to marry their boss for the ideal happy ending, Britain's communists urged them to join the Women's Cooperative Guild and the peace movement instead. The influx of women workers into the factories in World War II prompted the party to step up the fight for trade unionisation and equal pay. I did an engineering course in a school of technical training in order to qualify as an airframe fitter. I'd never seen or experienced anything like that before. I'd just done, uh, I had done clerical work, but done other menial jobs. And, uh, well, it really fascinated me, you know. It was something I'd never experienced before, and it's a real sense of achievement. But unfortunately, I didn't get the same wages. We had about 80% of a man's wage. The Daily Worker pointed out that in the Soviet Union, women were perfectly capable of doing so-called men's work. And communist women blazed a trail in the wartime shop stewards movement, campaigning for welfare and nursery facilities. Initiated through the People's Convention, a women's parliament in 1941, sparked a powerful movement for equal pay. When the House of Commons granted it to women teachers, wartime Prime Minister Churchill stopped it by threatening to resign. After the war, through the National Assembly of Women, communist-led community campaigns on prices, wages, benefits, health services and peace. One of those campaigners, Annie Powell, won a council seat and went on to become communist mayor of the Rhondda. In the early 60s, party pressure committed the TUC to support an industrial charter for women. Communists helped draft the demands of the Women's Liberation Conference in Oxford for abortion and contraception rights, childcare facilities and equal opportunities in employment and education. The biggest blows for equal pay were struck by the women machinists at Fords in Dagenham and Halewood in 1968 and 71. Many of the shop stewards were communists or were influenced by the party's broad left strategy in the labour movement. Their struggle produced the first Equal Pay Act, an important step forward but no guarantee for equal pay in practice. <laughs> 